I think that's amazing. Great work. Well, I want to I wanna start from very earlier. How, okay. How did you start uh, being interested in medicine and then excision of endometriosis? Like, what was the back story there? There's, I don't know, chronic pelvic patients are like, a, like the riddle. Like this enigma that nobody shows us how to understand them or how to treat them. So every time we try to treat them, there's like only one way to go and you really don't solve the problem. You'll just like try to cover up the symptoms. Like it hurts here, you take this pill and the pain go away, but you don't take away the source of the pain. So I went to an IRCA in Barretos in Brazil and I was in, the, in a bus and this guy was talking about, well, if you're so passionate about pelvic pain, why don't you study some neuropelbiology? And I was like, huh, what's that? And he was telling me about the International Society of Neuropelbiology and that you could do some levels and you could start studying everything. And I got hooked. I, I got into the page line and I started studying. And you can see the lectures that Dr. Bosover uh, tells you in the webinars. And those were amazing. So I started to getting more into it, into, into it and into it and into it. That quote that says that pain is not a pathology. Pain is information that travels through the nerves. That one, like, okay. So you don't have to fight this. You have to understand this in order to try to treat your patient. So, yeah, the, it got me, it really got me engaged into it. And uh, I'm trying to study as much as I can to understand the patient's pain. And endometriosis surgeries, I think whenever you're trying to do GYNs, well, whenever we were doing laparoscopy and stuff, I, I started to see that excision surgeries were so rare, but they were their standard the gold standard for treatment. So they were like, okay, there's no way that we are treating this disease the way that the wrong way. So I, there has to be a better way in order to treat these patients. So we started studying more, studying more, studying more, and that's how I got into it. I think it was in both ways, um, trying to give us solutions to a lot of patients that I have. And I, I felt like I was fighting with the wrong tools. So I have to get better into it in order to help. When did you see your first excision surgery? Like in what setup you saw the first excision surgery? Like a proper excision surgery. I was in Dubai with uh, a, uh, in, well, um, in Latifa Hospital, Dr. Ano Batiez. I think that was a proper excision surgery. One, yeah, the, one of the first ones that I saw. Were you were you resident at that point, or you were an attending? No, no, I was. Uh, yeah, I was an attending. Yeah, I didn't have any laparoscopy in my residency because in the hospital that I did my residency, there were like laparoscopy. They didn't find it useful for us to learn. Wow. So I had to learn it afterwards. I have to pay the courses. I have to take some extra um, diplomates. And I had to do, I took, I took two master courses. Um, that's why I went to Dubai to see the anatomical landmarks course and the advanced management of endometriosis course. Yeah, it's, they call it a master course. Yeah, so yeah. And during this uh, training for laparoscopy, then you were exposed to endometriosis and excision during that training? At first, no. No, at first, um, my, f my friends who were surgeons, but general surgeons, told me that I had to get into laparoscopy. So I went to a, uh, a diplomat, but it wasn't about GYMs. It was about general surgery and urologists. So the first things that I've learned in laparoscopy is to remove appendix, to remove gallbladders, to remove <laughs> kidneys. So yeah, the, I had a little uh, turnover into the, yeah, but I, I'm, yeah, I'm very tough headed. So whenever there's a, an idea in my head, I have to get to it. Right. Oh my God. This is like, you know, when you say you're tough headed, uh, we were talking with, with Dr. Molly in Singapore and, uh, and also with Ramiro, it's the same thing. Like, Molly was like, I had this thing in my head. She, she, I, do you know Molly? She's in single. Mm. Maybe a, I haven't, no. Yeah, she's an excellent surgeon. She's widow vetted by IKEA Better. She says, when I said, 
when she said her mind on something, then there is no way she has to go and get it. And similar to you, like she has no, she has nothing. Like no one is teaching her, but then she keeps going and learning. So I see. Yeah. You got it to your <laughs> virus. <laughs> direction. You have a commitment, and you have to get to it. Like yeah, I think yeah. You have to be a little tough-headed in order to pursue endometriosis. So when you were learning excision of endometriosis, what was the biggest challenge for you in your way of learning? To unlearn the things that I have already learned. Like you have to remove the ovaries or that you have to remove the uterus. It was or the way that you can preserve structures or the mapments also that we didn't use to make of mapments. At the beginning, we were only doing uh, diagnostic laparoscopies. And then we started doing mapments and then we started doing real diagnosis and real surgeries, excising everything. But at the, at the beginning, we, uh, we didn't know how to handle this. I mean, I think we are getting closer, but we are, are haven't figured out this disease fully. I completely agree. And I love what you said to unlearn what you learned, because I think we have a century knowledge to unlearn. Yes. <laughs> many, yeah, yeah. You should burn the little chocolate chips. I was like, how many patients do we burn? I was like, no, yes. Yeah, I totally yeah. understand. So then, so then, so you got into excision, obviously, so you try to learn it as, as much as possible. And you said like this was an accident in, in Brazil, someone talked about neuropervology. So tell me, then what happened? So you hear about neuropervology and that quote that pain is information. So tell yes. me what happened then? Then what, what did you do? I, it was like many things. At, at the same time, I met uh, Dr. Ramiro Cabrera in Mexico, and he was like telling me about neuropelvic anatomy. And I was like, what? Yeah, you know, you can dissect the nerves in the pelvis. I'm like, what? Yeah, you should come to this course. We're doing a cadaveric lab with a Dr. Kondo and a, a lot of doctors, like really high names. And I was like, okay, I'm hooked. <laughs> I have to get into this. So I went to the course and I loved it. And um, I started studying the the, the, there are these levels for the International Society of Neuropelviology. You do the first level online. And then we were in 2020 and the pandemic exploded. <laughs> so everything went like nothing. And then uh, there was like uh, this message in my mail that the first workshop for level two was opening and that I could have a space. So I was like, okay. I have to get to Zurich. I have to start like really understanding this. And I went to Zurich to study with Dr. Posover and it was an amazing, an amazing workshop. That's amazing. Yeah. Yes. So you go there through the level two with Dr. Posover yeah. and you basically bring back what's left to do in terms of like increasing your skills and knowledge in I think the best thing about learning from Dr. Posover was First, the way that he explores the patients and the way that he performs the clinical history, like the neuropelviology way of thinking. Like you have to look about the connections or the nerve that connects everything. And that was one of the, the most amazing things, right? So then while well, doing like a proper clinical history in order to understand the history of the pain and then the physical exploration that gives us so many clues with our patients. So that helps me a lot. And then for surgeries, we started doing uh, the neuronavigation that Dr. Posover, yeah, we took a little bit, that, that one took me a little more time. I came back to Mexico and then I, I was working in Querétaro. But then I wanted to publish something of what we were, we were doing. And at the end of the workshop, Dr. Posover told us that we have to publish some of the things that we have learned there in order to get to be level three. So I talked to Ramiro and I was like, okay, can you help me do something like this? Do you have a cadavers? Because in Mexico, it's really hard to do a cadaveric lab. And he was like, no, but I have a friend and maybe we can do something. 
So it was February last year, and then we did. Uh, we went to SLU, to St. Louis University, to perform some cadaveric dissections and to get some proper videos of the dissections of the pelvic nerves. It was also amazing, and we did a lot of really good videos about how you have to find the sacral nerve roots and the, um, the sciatic nerve, well, the obturator's fossa, the lumbar sacral trunk, and everything. So. It was a very, very strong, instructive, uh, like, weekend. And then we went back a few months later to the Pelvic Anatomy Expo. So it was really amazing. I remember those <laughs> So there is a, so you talked about, like, everything started with a good history, like, neuropelvology history. Yes. I remember once we were talking yeah. about, you, you have a video, a training video of how to do pelvic exam, like, regional pelvic exam. Yes. And, <clears throat> yeah, I show them sometimes. So I have seen some uh, some surgeons who love that video. Like they say, like you you talk about some really like unusual stuff, like the temperature. Can you explain like how how you perform a pelvic exam? What's your like okay. conception of a pelvic exam? Well, uh, the consult begins at the waiting room. So you have to see your patients. Taking how do they take a seat? If they take a seat, if they are using like a little cushion in order to sit properly, if they are using a cane or they're using like stirrups or something. A consult begins, so I always go outside and see how is their patient and then ask them, ask them to come to my office and then I watch them how they walk and which leg are they using more. So yeah, everything counts. So the day before, I send them like a pre-medical history and they have to answer a questionnaire that I read before this, uh, the consultation. I usually prepare for my consults the day before, and so I have, I have much, some of the knowledge of what is going to be about, but we do the whole clinical history during our consultation. After the consultation, I have some suspects, so I have to check them up in the physical exploration. So normally, uh, you have to check the diameter or both the calves and the thighs, so you have to do them bilaterally because sometimes they have edema or they have muscle atrophy because they are not moving their legs properly. So you have to check both of the diameters in the actually at the half of the calf and at the half of the thigh. Then you check a temp temperature bilaterally. The temperature helps us because if they have lesions at the inferior hypogastric plexus, there's a vasoconstriction and this won't, like, it'll, it'll diminish the temperature on the affected leg. So this will also help us to give us some clues about the source of the pain. But it's like a full workup. <laughs> like, uh, then you have to see uh, the dermatomes. So we take a Q-tip or you can do it with a cytobrush and you have to draw lines from the siphon apophysis into the toes. I mean, you have to go all the way. Sometimes, even with patients, with patients, especially patients with endometriosis, they do have this like loss of feeling or they do start to feel more or less in the abdomen or in the legs. They describe them as tingling or a hypersensitization or a diminished sensitization. So you start looking for clues and the way of the pattern of their pain. So you have to be really thorough and start to see the way that your patients react. So you have to start looking at the patient's eyes at all the time. And then you start touching. There's some points that you can touch in order to check for the nerves. So you take the, you start to do the tinnel sign. So you got to do the genitofemoral nerve, then you do pudendal nerve, and then you do sciatic nerve. So you have to check the patients from then back and then you can see the dermatomes. We have to remember that the front are always or more usually lumbar region and the back of the leg is sacral lesion. But also the little nerves that come from these nerves are also distributed in the leg. So you can do some patterns and you can see how the pattern of the pain distributes so you can have a better idea of how the, the pain distributes in the patient or how does the nerves travel. We have to remember that in the pelvis, the point of th that they describe or the localization of the pain is not where the lesion is. It just gives us the clue or where which nerves is the pain using to travel. So you have to understand that um, if there's a bulb and there's a wire and there's a connector, if you cut the wire, it doesn't matter where you cut the wire, the bulb is going to be off. So our job is to find out 
not that the nerve or that the wire is cut, but where is it cut? So yeah, <laughs> then we have to, <laughs> yeah. And then we do it like um, as well, L reflexes. We have to remember L4 is the knee reflex. S1 is the Achilles reflex. And then we go, you have to check if the, the movement, um, the rotation of the leg, I can show you some videos, like, uh, but you have to say the obturator nerve, the femoral nerve, the femoral nerve. We have to check them all. So yeah, it takes me like an hour, an hour and a half to do a, pre a proper exploration. And then we do it vaginally. So I have uh, the, yeah, the luck to be working with physical therapists and they show me where, how to check for the bulbocavernosus muscle, for the, the, yeah, and all of the muscles I can check in order if there's a contraction. Because as we know, sometimes patients with endometriosis not only have pain because they do have endometriosis and endometriosis related pain, but they also have muscular contractions. They also can have vascular compressions. They also can have additions and they also do have cause pain. So we have to check for every cause of the pain. And then we do, yeah, basically <laughs> that'll be it. And then uh, I'll perform an ultrasound. And if there is any need, we can do, we'll uh, get uh, an ultrasound mapment or an MRI mapment for the nerves. This is great. So I love it. This is so comprehensive. When you said you measure the calves and thighs and you look at the seating, I think that's, that blew my mind. Um, I want to know one thing. So let's. So you do the, you do all this exam, and then you conclude that there is some nerve involvement, like on the pudendal or on sciatic or, or any other nerve that you would anticipate to be uh, involved. So in a lot of centers in the world, no, no one does this that you do. They just go and do the operation based on imaging or, on, or the perception or patient history. They go do the surgery, cut a lot of lesions. Sometimes the nerve might get damaged or, or if they don't want to get damaged the nerve, they don't even go close to it. So they leave some, some lesions around the nerve because they are worried about the complications. So I know you use some new methodology because because you don't want to leave the lesions there because patient is going to be in pain. On the other side, you don't want to go and cut it blindly because that might have a complication. You have this new methodology that you are implementing in your surgery. Can you explain that, what that is and how you use that? Yes, uh, well, it's not really new because uh, neurosurgeons or traumatologists who uh, operate on the column have done for several years. I learned this from Ricardo Ferreira and from Dr. Nuselio Lemus. I was fortunate enough to see their work in Sao Paulo last year in September. I went there for like two weeks and I learned so, so much from there. From there. So the way that Dr. Ferreira starts, like it's not stimulating the nerve, but they do monitor the energy going through these nerves. So they put some wires in the patient and then you can see from the dermatomes and the nerves that get into the muscle. You can get to the nerves of the legs and the legs in the perineum. And I learned that we can do that, that the, this can be reproduced also in Mexico. But you have to convince the, all the neurophysiologists that work because they usually work up until the lumbar plexus, but they don't go into the sacrum. But we can, do, we can go into the sacrum so we can monitor pudendal or sciatic nerves. Uh, the terminal branches of the pudendal nerve are the dorsal of the clitoris and then the transverse perineum and the uh, extrinsic anal sphincter, so we can monitor them. So we have to came up with our own way of doing this, but our neurophysiologist, well, it took us a little while in finding the right neurophysiologist, but now that we have found him, that every time we were, uh, he was like, okay, I'm gonna give away 10 of my fees, and we have to do this and we have to do this right. So he started like uh, moving some of the wires and started to like really getting into the way that we have to perform the surgery, but him to properly connect the wires in order to don't miss any nerve. So it's been a little bit <laughs> like, a, it, yeah, it's been almost a year of go, going far, backwards and forwards, but I think that we have our way of doing this <laughs> a little bit, yes. This is fascinating. So you basically brought a neurophysiologist and trained them. And now, now in your surgeries, if you uh, 
If you anticipate someone has neuro involvement, you have a neurophysiologist. We have, uh, yes. If, if we are going to get into the obturator space or into sacral nerve roots, we have to have a neurophysiologist in the room. No, I wouldn't do it elsewhere. No, I, I don't know. No, I won't. Because we know the complications. We know that nerves get injured so easily. Like uh, there's there's been so many studies, but uh, the ones that we really know more are the ones that says that, OK, yeah, so uh, the um, gripping force of a very ex experimented surgeon are like approximately six, six newtons. The gripping force of a resident, it's like eight newtons. And then they started to pro compress sciatic nerves and they saw that the vascular flow diminishes after 0.2 newtons. So even if you slightly touch nerve, you can injure it. So even you're getting close to it with heat. You're sometimes they even pull to the nerves in order to look, oh, this is the nerve. So we can do so much damage. And I don't like, like, I would like to try to be as thorough as possible. And surgery of the nerve, this has to be really, really calmly done in order to excise the endometriosis around the nerve. This is fascinating. Where do you do this procedure? What centers do you pro uh, do these operations? The most of the surgeries have been done in Londres Clinica, the Instituto de Yen, in Ciudad de México. We have also done the surgeries in Morelia, in our institute, in Hospital Ángeles Morelia. And uh, we've recently done this in, like, I think it was four patients last, uh, uh, like, a month ago in Guatemala. Amazing. Do you do yeah. you have this technology in uh, Tijuana for endo global group? We are trying to get there. Yes. Uh, yeah. I pro probably if I, by this uh, this time in September there are gonna be this technology also in endo global group. Okay. So because yeah. that's for international patients if they wanna yes. come to you. Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah. That's awesome. So mm -hmm. a few a few weeks ago I had. Uh, yeah. A conversation with a patient, and uh, and she had some some pain in, in her pelvic area, and, mm -hmm. and she has been seen with multiple doctors. And things, but to me, it seemed like it's a pelvic congestion syndrome. And uh, I actually asked her to go to you. I don't know. If oh, she, thank she you. Said, <laughs> she, said she contacted me. Okay. I want to ask you a couple of questions about pelvic congestion syndrome. If that's yes, okay. of course. Yes, perfect. So can you explain to us in simple words, like what is pelvic congestion syndrome? Yes. It's like, have you ever seen like cartoons where the roadrunner or something uh, like collapses a hose and then it started going up, up, up and bigger and bigger and bigger because all of the water cannot move and then the water the hose becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger right okay so that's a congestion your veins are trying to get the blow back to the heart so whenever there's a clot or a clog or a kink in the tube or the pipe the blood will not go back and it will stuck there and then the diameter of the vessel will increase if the diameter of the vessel increases there's like a um, like I try it every time, there's an artery, a vein, and a nerve. So if the vein starts to go bigger, the nerve gets compressed. So that's sometimes the, the source of the pain. And also, if you cannot go through one way, there's another anomaly, like the, the, the same vein starts growing another ways to get the, the blood flow into going back to the vena cava. So whenever there's an anatomical anomaly, that also causes pain. Also, in patients with retroverted uterus, the blood flow cannot come up the, the same way, and sometimes the blood compresses or stays there, and that produces also pain. So, yeah, pelvic congestion syndrome, are, it can be two things. It can be an uh, anatomical anomaly, but also it can be, um, in the second, it could be also be like a very, like a non-functional vein. Like, it, it's not, the walls of the vein, it's not really tough, that they are like not tough enough so the blood flow cannot go back or the little like valves that the vein have in order to get the blood flow going back they don't work really properly so you have to help them so. 
what's the relationship with uh, endometriosis in pelvic congestion syndrome? Do you see it more common in endometriosis patients? I see a lot of chronic pelvic pain patients and some of them have endo and some of them don't. I mean, sometimes it can get confused with endo because if I told you that I have a patient with dysmenorrhea that has strong alterations in their blood flow or during their menses, they can have a lot of pain and sometimes they have a lot of blood flow loss and they do have some, and it's rhythmical. This pain, it's rhythmical. The chronic pelvic pain is rhythmical and it's also with their menstruation. Like you, the first thing that you think about is endometriosis, right? So we had this patient, uh, a 20 year old, and she was diagnosed with endo at 16 years old. And she had uh, blood, blood coming through her urine. So they were thinking about um, endometriosis in the bladder. And we find out that she didn't have any endometriosis <laughs> because the thing was that there was a king or an anatomical anomaly in her mesenteric artery. It was compressing the renal vein. So this is called a nutcracker syndrome. And this blood flow, could not, uh, like, it's like a little snowball, right? So it started compressing and compressing and compressing and the ovarian vein gets really big. And in these cases, it causes a lot of pain and it's during their menses. So she had another type of surgery. She didn't need it, any dianogest or any map. I mean, she did get a mapman in order to take away the, yeah, the differential diagnosis of endometriosis. But um, sometimes the symptoms can get mixed up. So you have to look for all of the causes of the pain. I mean, endometriosis, it is one of the most common causes of pelvic pain in women, but it's not the only one. So the reason that it comes up in endometriosis is because of the overlapping symptoms, basically. Yes. Not basically. It happens very often in patients with endometriosis. Yes. Has there been any studies? Like, because I would imagine because endometriosis distorts the anatomy, like the adhesions yes. might, might, you know, compress the veins. Has the adhesions, been... I don't have one at the top of my head, but I can, I can find one. <laughs> also, uh, patients that... For example, there are less than those patients that have some alterations and with the collect, I mean, they do get into the anatomically variations. So that's how they get compressed, the compression of the nerves because of this. Also, patients with adenomyosis have retroverted uterus. So this can also be a problem with the way that the blood flow comes back. But yeah, a congestic pelvic uh, syndrome can be one cause of pelvic pain. But sometimes it gets mixed with endometriosis and it happens in endometriosis patients, but not every time. We have, I work, I, I'm sorry, I work with a vascular surgeon and we approach this in a different way with phlebography because sometimes in the angio MRI, it doesn't show. So sometimes when I explore the patients, it has happened that I feel an abnormal pulse in their vagina, in some of the walls. So I was like, okay. And if the patient has varicose veins in their legs, we started with the angio MRI. But if there's a suspicion, we perform a phlebography. There's like this huge point that I can show you in a, like a scheme. And he goes into each and every one of them and he diminishes the flow of each and every one of these points of huge that it can get into the venous system that gets like mixed up. So whenever we find one of those, uh, he performs this in a chemo-controllable, like this uh, surgery, and he does it really well. So this has helped some of our patients also. I see. So for patients, if they are suspecting or they have heard they might have pelvic congestion syndrome, basically, um, there is, it's a, it's a, if they don't have endometriosis, there is a chance for pelvic congestion. But if they have endometriosis, there is also some chance that they have pelvic congestion. Also, yeah, they can be both of them. I mean, it's okay. like a PCOS maybe, right? There are, there are patients that have PCOS and endo, and there are patients that only have PCOS, right? And yeah, then sometimes they do get mixed up into diagnosis. There are two different diseases. I see. It's pretty, it's, it's a very complex, I think, differential of diagnosis between yes. the two. And both of yeah. them are hard to diagnose if you think about them, right? Yeah. <laughs> so not that simple. Okay. No. Awesome. <laughs>
Yeah, but uh, the, the thing is that uh, the pain is real for the patient. So you have to find the way that how it's affecting them and how is the pain like presenting to your patient. So sometimes uh, pa patients with pelvic congestive syndromes will feel relief during their menses. The pain will begin with the ovulation and will diminish during their menses, but not all of them. Some of them will have pain during their menses, just like endo patients. So it, yeah, it overlaps. What's the treatment for pelvic congestion syndrome? It depends on the cause, because if the veins are really like not tough, you can give them a phlebostatic, like something that makes the, the walls better. But for example, in May Turner's or Nutcracker syndrome, we have to do a, like a endovascular surgery. So it depends. Okay, I see. Awesome, great. So I'm going to ask you a couple of uh, less like fully professional, more personal, professional questions. Yeah, don't worry. Of course, okay. yes. So I'm I'm hearing from you. You are involved in multiple projects, of course, and uh, you are probably doing your some of your own thing. What's the project that you are most excited about at this point? Right now, um, I think. Uh, like the dream would be to get neuromodulation into Mexico. I think we can help so many patients, even if we only begin with pudendal nerve neuromodulation, I think that will help us so, so much. Yeah, that'll be like, like the dream to create um, like a school of neuro, neuro pelviology in Mexico so that more doctors can get into this. Now, like not only gynecologists, but this can also be open for urologists, trauma surgeons. It has all, everybody gets into the pelvis. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, and so I think this is something that we we all as doctors need to know. Maybe, maybe you should start having the courses similar to what you have gone to. Like, how long before you can have a course? Uh, I don't know, Some someday, and I'll let you know. <laughs> I, I would love to know. <laughs> yes, yeah, it'll be amazing, but someday. Okay. We'll get there. Yes. So the next question is, uh, you know, excision of endometriosis and generally surgery, when you get to the advanced part, is uh, mostly dominated by males. Yes. And, um, and you are a female doctor, and leading the whole section of the disease neuropelvology in in endo latin in mexico can you talk about that like what's the first of all what do you think about this second what are the challenges if there are any i think at the beginning i, I felt it more when i was beginning school and stuff i think it was way back like 10 years ago uh, we have like restrooms for doctors and for nurses so I was like, <laughs> but I'm, I'm a female doctor, <laughs> like I'm not a nurse. But, but right now, I think I've, I've felt more and more the support of my professors and uh, of my friends now. I think it has changed with the, within the years. I think there is a lot of space for us women to start growing into this. And our new fellows, I've seen more and more of them, like it's normal to be a female surgeon, right? And when I was studying, I was like, I, we were like the, the weird ones because if you want to have like the ideal, normal female life, you cannot be a surgeon. But I think we're changing this paradigm a little by little, right? So yeah, so yeah, I think the challenges sometimes it's in our head. So the thing that we have to change is this idea of something like perfect and square then that you have to do some paper or some yeah you have to perform some role in your house and in the OR. Um, I love this quote that says uh, there is no balance. You cannot think about uh, there is a balance between being a mom and a surgeon. Like there is no balance. You are a better mother because you are a surgeon and you are a better surgeon because you are a mother. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you have to get the, both of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. I hear yeah, I think I, I guess again goes back to mental. It's it's our our own limitations that you can do it. I mean, uh, as well as they do because we are both humans, right? Not because we're of our genders. I completely agree with you, and uh, so you know, I think maybe a part of it is has been exactly like the word balance, like work-life balance, and. Uh, 
maybe it has changed or not, or maybe the perception has changed, but I completely understand what, what you say about um, being in the war, because I think um, it's important to have, of course, every every talented person have the potential to do this. Another question for you, what's, uh, what's your favorite sport? I'm not very good at sports. <laughs> I like running. I like running a lot and bicycle. Yes, I like them both. Yes, so I, I'm not really good. I, I practice, like, I try to work out every day, but it's not like I'm, I'm very good with one sport. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I know. So when but was yeah. the last time that you ran? Yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah, I, yeah, I try to run every day. Yes. A oh, little wow. bit, like 10K. No, no, nothing like a marathon or something like that. No. It's, it, or, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's also a good number, 5 and 10K. It's not, it's not <laughs> so it's fine. So is this is the thing that you do when you go to a new city or country, that's part of the fun to run and explore? Yes, the city. Yeah, you can go into whatever new streets and then you can really find about the city whenever you are walking or running into it. And then you can ask locals where you can run and there's always some form of a park that you can run and I like it very much. I love it. I love the idea. Did you watch Olympics? The, the track and field? Yeah, I couldn't run uh, like all of them. I couldn't. I saw this new documentary in Netflix about the guys that they do sprints and I was amazed. Yes. <laughs> it's amazing that there was this, the one that fascinated me was the final of 400 meters in men. Mm -hmm. This was, There was this guy who was from the US and he was behind until the last 50 meters like he was not oh my god uh -huh. then he it's like he gave up the body it, when you say everything is in his brain uh -huh. like, i am giving up everybody everything my body just ran in the last 50 meters he went and won the gold medal he was not it was in the fourth position wow. i have to see this you should watch it it's like 40 okay. seconds it's amazing wow. It's fascinating. Amazing. Okay. Yeah, I'll try to see. Yeah, I'm going to look for it. Thank you so much. Of course. It's, it was such a like inspiring moment to watch. So, next question for you. Look, I, I have met you in multiple locations and I have seen your videos and pictures. You, you have a calm and a kind face, right? <laughs> and, Thank you. Uh, you're always a smiley. But the surgery field and surgeons are known to be like aggressive and mean and like not like, what 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 do you think of it? What's the contrast here? I tried not to because whenever you're losing half of the weight, I mean, um, I think I've I've lost it sometimes when I was at the beginning because you carry so much weight, but then you realize that. This is the thing that you enjoy the most. So why don't you enjoy it? <laughs> like, okay, we have a lot of responsibility in the OR and stuff, but yeah, one of my friends were like, do you realize that you're doing what you were dreaming? Like uh, 10 years ago, you, you're doing it. You get it there. Let's enjoy it. You know, like, okay, let's enjoy it. And yeah, I think you don't have to yell or you don't have to like act in a way. There is still a lot of responsibility and we have to act serious to it. And we owe so much to our patients. But I think we have to enjoy the moment that we are and the things that we do because it is what we love. And since my beginning in medicine, I've always felt peace in an OR. It was weird. Whenever I was in there, I was like, okay, this is a place to be. I mean, I was like, okay, this is wonderful. <laughs> So yeah, I try to pass this like feeling of peace whenever I'm with anybody who is not in my team. That's a, that's amazing. Yeah, I hear you. Um, you know, uh, sometimes I things can get tough, but it's always good to keep your calm. And I love that you are always a smiley and kind. I'm pretty sure you have your own way of <laughs> punishing people, but. <laughs> When I was in the residency, we have to, but everybody knew that I was the soft one. So whenever there's have to be some punishment, they didn't send me because I wasn't <laughs> like, yeah. No, uh, when I was in my first year of residency, they were tough. I mean, you couldn't uh, get a shower, you couldn't use elevators, 
you don't have a locker, you couldn't eat. I mean, um, our interns have to sneak up uh, food and stuff. So yeah, first year was horrible for me. So I thought like, you have to break the chain of horribleness because I was about to quit on my first year. So we're like, there's no need for you to suffer. I mean, work is tough. So you, you don't have to suffer even more, right? So yeah, we, we keep some with some of the traditions, but not all of them. I, I really don't see the point to pass on more trauma. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I'm going to stop recording now. Okay, yes.